leadership skills uh, as the director of the uh, interdisciplinary and universe at the University of Florida, the mindfulness programs. I understand you're a longtime meditator, Tai Chi, many other areas of mindful practices, and I'm sure we'll hear more about things like that today. Uh, her research includes mind, body, well-being, wellness, and that makes her the perfect speaker for her to start off our wellness in nature uh, a talk program here at Ding Darling. At the end of today's talk, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ranger Jess will be providing additional information on upcoming events. So without further ado, I do introduce Dr. Grenwald. Thank you so much for the introduction. And welcome everybody uh, to today's lecture. Started. So, when we think about time and how we spend our time, uh, this will be an exploration today in terms of are we plugged in and digital kind of platforms and tools, or are we spending time also for us or in nature? Because these are changing because our, our culture, our world is changing. There's more and more technology around, and this will be a, also a major theme in terms of how we really, um, okay, <laughs> how we spend our time. And I'd like to start with a question. How do you spend your time each day? And can you think about maybe the top three, just for a moment? Just hold those thoughts mentally. Now, as a follow-up question, how would you like to spend your time each day? And are these things, activities, or things you like to pursue different than what you actually do? So when I think about how I spend my time, most of the time, there's a lot of work. I work at the university, and uh, it's a quite fast-paced program. What I like to do is to spend more time on my own, <laughs> meditating, being in nature. And work, of course, infringes on that uh, a little bit, I must say. Uh, yet there are these really uh, differences in terms of sometimes what we do and what we wish we would do. Now, in terms of time spent overall, of course, as I said, there is uh, work, there is study, learning, there is leisure time and, and, and pleasure time, uh, social time and me time. And depending, uh, uh, there are differences, of course, how people also spend their time. When we look at also the distribution, and I hope you can see this here, the minutes spent, uh, the US is about here, and there's a gap between the gender. When we look at women and men, how they spend their time, 360 minutes uh, of, um, of uh, leisure time is spent by men and 267 by women. And I'm not sure if we simply have to work harder <laughs> or spend our time, spend less time on leisure, but to, this is how it looks like. Right? And we look at the uh, distribution in terms of also minutes, in terms of uh, 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 over time, we see here also a distribution by age. For example, as older we get, Right? So all that we get, there is a, a difference in terms of social time, the time spent alone keeps increasing, whereas also over time we see here in particular younger people, they are much more engaged, dynamic, socially oriented, and it flattens off over time, out of various reasons, as we also know as we grow older. There are differences also in terms of the work time spent based uh, in different countries. And what we note is, in particular, the last decades, we see here also that it has flattened off, right? There's no more rapid increase except for 
in Germany that uh, keeps also going down. And so it continues in terms of the time that is spent uh, overall that gives us some clues in terms of what's going on here. Uh, we see here also in distribution by uh, gross domestic product and also the work hours spent. And here we see that the US is uh, on this side uh, in terms of higher income, but it comes also at a price, right, in terms of other countries that spend much more time at work, but actually earn much less. So I could go on and on with these curves to tell us something, but an important thing I like to spend here is in terms of, if we look at one day, and these are uh, based on analysis, how people actually spend their daily activities. Right? You see here that, of course, sleeping is important, and this might be an overestimate, nine hours, because there is also in, in the US a decline in the number of hours uh, of, of uh, sleep, in particular among college students. There seems to be also a big, big problem in terms of just muscling through it or partying through it rather than actually sleeping. But we see here in distribution, and I just like to make a few highlights here, in terms of most of these things are actually activities, right? Some have to do with self-care, some have to do with uh, also, of course, work-related uh, things. But there is a small proportion of religion. Uh, there is a small proportion also of uh, those type of things that truly give us open, unstructured space right? to just uh, slow down and uh, not engage in a fast-paced culture. Now, in terms of when it comes to digital, being plugged into the machine, you see here quite some shocking numbers. The daily time spent on social networking uh, by uh, internet users, and these are worldwide data over a longer period of time, and we see here a steady increase, and yeah, it seems to be flattening off. But the numbers here are quite shocking because these are uh, up to 150 or so minutes uh, per day that are spent, and the numbers are even more shocking for US because in terms of digital time spent online, kept increasing. We see also a flattening off, there seems to be also a saturation that has settled in. But we are about 500 or so minutes. And if you think about it, uh, how much time smartphones, internet, uh, some kind of looking into some kind of screen, we spent actually also doing that. Uh, uh, according to the statistics, it is telling us something. Right? Now the social media usage in the US has reached, according to Forbes, two hours and 25 minutes. Yeah, and that might be on the lower end, <laughs> depending on subpopulations uh, that we are looking at. Uh, uh, if you look at smartphone, how many times we, we pick it up? Uh, 159 times. Of course, there are some people that possibly are way above that number and some that uh, possibly are lower. So these are average data, right? But users will spend four trillion hours on social media this year. 46% of Americans say they watch more user-generated content uh, on social media than they watch in movies, for example. And so the numbers go on, in particular Facebook, seems to be also, of course, drawing, drawing on people. <laughs> so technology, and in particular also social media, has become also a, a big, big uh, problem. But what are the reasons that people are doing that? And here it is at the top of the list, of course, social connection, right? In terms of truly uh, uh, being connected with friends, family, uh, so social networking, and that draws in many uh, users. 
But the second one is quite interesting. Uh, here, uh, also with a very high percentage, right? It's just filling, filling time. Just because there seems to be nothing better to do, so just an activity to fill space. And that gives us a pause, because here it is truly also a reason that, well, does this give us meaning, fulfillment, or more happiness? just to fill our time. Uh, it seems that this is also one, uh, of course, of the uh, major, major uh, issues of our time. We see here other reasons, uh, of course, some are uh, also work or networking rela related. Some have to do with also engagement uh, uh, in various ways. Uh, but it, it is interesting also to uh, see in terms of what the reasons really are. Daily time spent on social media platforms, Facebook is still one of the largest ones that draws us uh, uh, in. So these numbers have been pretty steady. And uh, TikTok, Instagram, uh, and other platforms, of course, are close by. And there are more and more of these platforms, right? More and more choices. So they are not going away, but they seem to be also increasing in terms of the number that are out there. In terms of uh, TV, gaming, and computer usage, TV is still also up there as one mode uh, to watch. In particular, also streaming services have picked up big time because they are available at our fingertips, right? In terms of truly, we click on it, there they are. And of course, these type of being surrounded with so much digital technology has led also to numbers. Up to 10% of Americans may be even addicted to social media. Uh, now, they are different from wellness dimension, right? Uh, uh, so we consider here internal and external wellness dimensions, health, are uh, then also related to happiness, wealth, uh, and uh, also the last one uh, that we see here on the list. Now, in terms of internal and external, what is also uh, has been observed and documented is that when we think of digital platforms, they tend to draw the attention into the screen, into the machine, so that we lose also self-awareness of our internal world. In that sense, presence to be fully enjoying the moment in one's body, feeling the joy, right? That is something one has to become also aware of. But if my attention is drawn into some kind of digital media is actually drawn out, right? I'm very busy in terms of doing that. However, what is lost is also this internal dimension in terms of self-awareness and also this presence, being present, like we are currently in this room, sitting, listening in a topic that is of interest uh, to all of us, right? And so this is an important aspect that really digital compared to uh, uh, being here physically standing among all the different people in a group, it's very different. And so to recreate this type of self-awareness and other awareness also in the digital world, there are very different patterns at play. And they keep also changing in terms of our well-being factors. So what has changed? And this is one of the uh, most uh, used uh, well-being factor uh, scale developed in 1989, and it's still heavily used in research, psychological research. And we can see here the well-being dimensions is self-acceptance, positive relations with others, warm, satisfying really, uh, relations, autonomy, 
So feeling independence, I'm not drawn by some kind of network that is guiding and controlling me, you know, I have autonomy and I feel it right in my body. Environmental mastery, so competence, managing life, purpose in life, that's a big one. So having really a clear and fulfilled idea about what is my purpose? Why am I here? Right? That is not really a narrative of some kind of digital platform. And the last one is personal growth. And that's also important here in terms of becoming really also more self-aware. Right? Uh, yet we are struggling also uh, in particular uh, with younger generations to really get us there. So the impact in adolescence uh, uh, has also shown in, uh, uh, in terms of self-assessment, how young people really assess themselves. 32% says, that's well, mostly positive. Then 45%, uh, it's not positive or negative. But uh, there is also a tail end of 24% that is also quite high, I would say. Say it's, it's actually negative. So they are already suffering from this is not working, right? So the effects are different. Uh, but what is also has been found in this study uh, by our, our authors is that digital technology use has stronger effects on short-term markers. And this is called hedonic well-being. In essence, hedonic well-being is something that is more really temporary. It's fleeting. It's instant gratification. I get the ice cream. Or I get this new post. Ah, somebody responded to me positively. This is instant gratification. But it goes away quite quickly. In the next second, it's forgotten. And I need more. And that's where the addictive part also comes in, right? So in essence, it's fleeting. It's this hedonic kind of well-being and happiness. But if you look at digital technology in terms of the long-term measures of what's called eudaimonic well-being, in essence, this well-being that is grounded in, this is simply, I, I feel fulfilled and satisfied with my life. There's nothing to be added. I'm, I'm fine right now, but also long term, if I reflect back or forth, I like it. I'm OK. This is deep happiness that is fulfilling and satisfying. But we see also that really it negatively effect, uh, uh, affects uh, digital technology negatively. Uh, 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 it correlates also with this eudaimonic uh, well-being, eudaimonic happiness, because it's not brought forth. And this is quite important. So what has learned also from these studies, studying the effects of digital technologies, it is something that is temporary, that is short term, and it, these systems are created to give us more to draw people back in. Now, this tells us something about really how can we counter this to create also more of this long-term, deep, really happiness. And this is found, for example, in being fully present, right? Enjoying the moment. So going, for example, to the beach and fully enjoying the beach not being plugged in with a headphone or on screen or distracted in any way. No, just enjoying the environment and letting that fully sink in. So mindfulness, mindful presence is the key here that gives us also this, in this moment, I'm completely enjoying really the moment. And nature can do this very well. Uh, uh, in essence, also giving us this really healing space, just being there in this environment. There's nothing else that we need to do, right? Or engage in activities. Here yeah, it's actually opening up, opening up to what is there. 
And with that, actually, we find also that it provides us with this what is called eudaimonic well-being, this deeper, really emotionally loaded satisfaction. Now, uh, if you ask me, I would love to have this eudaimonic well-being and happiness. <laughs> uh, that is something also to uh, keep in mind with, uh, with uh, uh, learning from these studies. Now, in terms of digital technologies and impacts, we are moving now more towards uh, adults. Uh, digital technology, in essence, uh, uh, was shown also as interventions uh, to have, uh, uh, in essence, uh, uh, effects on uh, loneliness. And that's where digital technology can provide also and tool one replacement that helps people. And there are some positive effects. For example, getting grandma online, right? My uh, mom is uh, 81 years old and she is plugged into Zoom <laughs> and she can operate these video conferencing systems so that we can actually stay in touch because she lives far away uh, from where I live and it's great, right? very positive. Uh, yet, in terms of, of course, uh, if you look at other populations, like in particular, here I'd like to move to the last one. Uh, uh, when it comes to older people, the older we get, for example, senior citizen, retired people, uh, uh, affluent uh, older individuals, it was found also that the computer literacy and the uh, uh, frequency of internet use went down, it becomes harder to do, to deal with so many changes, so many upgrades, and it's different, right? There's a new screen, how do I operate it? So there's frustration and also kind of uh, a limit to what people can do. Now for some others, like for example, homeless adults what look, was looked here in one study, it is a lifeline because and phone at least gives them ways to stay connected, with some, to stay functional, right? And so, of course, their use, there were even one third of the homeless people that did not even have internet access. And so we see here, some are falling off the cliff. They are left out from the digital world, right? In terms of being not in there, and maybe it's for the better, I don't know, uh, yet, uh, this is also to consider. Now I'd like to also take a little pause here and uh, get also your reactions in terms of, do you share any similar experiences as was found in these research studies that um, you have noticed also in your life? to how can we counter this, right? In terms of uh, this, what I'm hearing is also a dissatisfaction, right? It's not satisfying for you, but possibly for the others as well. 
So how can we also provide uh, really something that counters these tendencies and build also social competencies, uh, interpersonal competencies to communicate in a way that is also more natural, right? So uh, these are really big, big, big problems of our time. Any other contribution? Yeah. Yes. I think of going into a doctor's office or a, mm -hmm. um, sometimes even a cashier in a store or a grocery store, and uh, they might say, Oh, how are you doing today? But no eye contact. They're looking at their computer already. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get no fulfillment from an automatic response like that mm -hmm. without having some expression on somebody's mm -hmm. face. And I don't think they get any either. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. But so I isolation. The, uh, the yeah. payoff is for watching the screen yeah. instead of looking at somebody's face. Yeah. Have you tried to engage? Yes. Yes. It's not easy. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's not easy. I wonder how you do it with uh, uh -huh. your college students yeah. in fact. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. <laughs> we, we have seen also patterns actually changing this. What, what you just described is distant. Right? Everybody's looking into their screen, rather into somebody's eyes, we said also. Uh, and this creates social disconnection. So my take on it is that we can provide a space uh, to invite others in. Right, uh, to simply also make people aware of what's going on. Maybe they are not aware that they are actually constantly looking at the screen rather than at you. So here's an invitation. I sometimes, uh, and this might be uh, a little bit also really rocking the boat on the other side, <laughs> that uh, I say something along the line like, um, yeah, uh, hello. <laughs> What's going on with you? How's your day going? <laughs> so to smile and give them a little boost and oh, yeah, that is typically a wake up moment happening on the other side. And uh, that creates just also this moment to interact and be present. Because mindful presence is not only about mindful presence about me, right? It is actually creating also mindful presence also with others. And I'm a big proponent also to invite and to build competencies, build capacities. Because the first step, if, if somebody is dissociated and distant and plugged into the screen, is to make them aware what's happening, right? Invite them to events or we have also at uh, the college uh, uh, trainings, uh, we have uh, action events, what we call it, interventions, uh, where we also uh, have exercises, we have also training events to uh, practice a specific mindfulness practices. Because mindfulness is being present in the moment in an accepting way. Right? Uh, being also there and, and, and open in a non-judgmental way. And this is also problematic for lots of people to accept. And acceptance means also accept the good, the neutral, and the bad. And usually when people hear uh, bad, I don't want this. I want something else. <laughs> I want the ice cream. I want the perks. I want the, you know, the success and everything else. But to accept also life is not only the good stuff. Sometimes there are things that we don't like. And so here it is about rebuilding actually relationships and reconnecting with also something that gives us more fulfillment from actually relating. And that is a work in progress, I would say. Yes. That's sort of way when I when I work with or not work with but interact with grandkids is like this 
keeps going through my brain on Saturday Night Live when they say that. That's the way it is, and that's the way I like it. Okay. <laughs> uh, remember? <laughs> and, um, I keep thinking, well, are, are we just caught into thinking our way is the way it worked for us, so it should work for you? Mm. And, and maybe there are certainly positive things that are coming out of what, mm -hmm. what's happening with that. And so I keep having this thing going on and trying to figure out, okay, there's certainly a part, but yet when it's snowing up north right now, they don't even get a snow day, they have to go on the line. You know, I mean, it's just, I keep yeah. thinking, well, what's the good? What yeah. is good that they don't have to make up extra days at the end of the year? Mm -hmm. or Whatever, but they're still on the line. Yeah, but, but what I'm also hearing from you, and this is something really important, to have a dialogue about it and actually talk about it or bring it forth in a conversation. This is something that has the online education, right, changing. How is that for you in terms of uh, uh, having a dialogue about it rather than bragging about it? rather than uh, what would be a better way? <laughs> and if so, is there a way to change it for the better? <laughs> right? To create a positive reframing uh, for it. And, and this is really something uh, really important to start in dialogue, to start also asking questions, right? So for example, if somebody doesn't like something, what is it about it that you really, what, how does it make you feel? How do you want to feel? And then get on track in terms of, is there a way to also change the pattern? Because here, uh, there are different relations and responses we can provide. So uh, my take on it is rather be the change agent. If you want to have also better relations, there's something, some emotional work that needs to be done to also uh, create those more positive, fulfilling, satisfying relations. Uh, they don't happen in this like step of an eye and not just there. Uh, so here it is also a process right, to create presence, to create also mindful interactions. Yeah. One last like, thought that keeps coming up is and I thought it was interesting what you said about just the way that we had it, you know, our grandparents are just now, like, is it better than our technology? I feel like technology, the way it's grown is exponentially faster mm -hmm. than humans can keep up. So, like, we don't evolve that quickly, and we're all just going crazy. But, like, technology has grown so quickly that it's like humans haven't caught up yet. And so, like, I look at these mindfulness exercises and things that you do, like you said, to, like, counteract that. It's just like, we haven't caught up yet. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? And so you have to find uh -huh. a way to like slow, it feels like you can slow something down that's moving so fast. Yeah. And you see like how fast your industry is plateaued. Like I wonder are we at the top of the curve? But it's nice to be slowing down a little. It's interesting. Like, like it's just from <laughs> yeah. like yeah. overnight. Yeah. Like I've been in 10 years. It's really yeah. So adaptation. Yeah. Right? We need to find ways. Technology also will not completely go away anymore. It will stay. So here, how can we build better relations with the technology, right, and use them also in a way that are beneficial for us and for others, and be part of that process? Maybe we have to voice it more and articulate it more uh, and bring it forth uh, or complain in some uh, instances too, to create better ways. Uh, I just feel um, so disturbed mm -hmm. when I Mm -hmm. uh, screen. And you go to a restaurant and every, you know, you're used to seeing families where no one's talking because they're all on the screen. But then the, they, a one-year-old will have this digital thing going on in front of them right. and it's crazy, you know? I, I just, what's going to happen to those children? You know? The brain, the neurons, we, right? We, we, yeah. we didn't have a television. Yeah. We have mm -hmm. a, a daughter who's grown now, but we mm -hmm. didn't have TV when she was little. And whenever we would take her out to a restaurant, we, her head would go like this because she could see the TV of the <laughs> She'd never seen, you know, so we're like, oh, look at that. But you know, these kids are, they're a year old or a year and a half, and they're propped up with an iPhone. It's hard. Yeah. 
horrible. But it's just, I don't know what's bad. You can't walk up to people and go, hey, you're, stop abusing your kid. Talk to her, you know, and take that phone away, you know. But it, it, there it is. You know, we've all seen it. Yeah. There, there is hope, though. We were in a restaurant a few years ago, Jack Aranda, the old, the old oh, original. Yeah, the old Jack. And in walked a man and his wife and three teenage girls, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a screen to be seen. Good. And when we walked out, I walked over to the table and I asked this gentleman, I said, how do you get so fortunate to sit here with four beautiful women, number yeah, one, right. and three teenage girls who don't, have a, who don't have a screen in their hand? And all three of the girls nodded their head, like, you know, this is how we were brought up. Yeah, yeah. When I was growing up, or even, shame on me, my, when my daughter was little, the playpen and the TV. Yeah. Because you're doing something else. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how you break that cycle. But, kids but really there's, up when there's you, hope. You the, the, go to kindergarten, you're not going to be able to. Yeah. But the thing about it, when the, the ones who are brought up with that screen are the ones who can help us when the technology goes a wall on us. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are balances there, too. <laughs> Finding ways. To also question it, start a conversation, uh, and perhaps change some of the patterns. I know also some parents uh, who have become very strict with screen time. Right? There's an encounter, uh, also movement happening, with some parents who said, absolutely, we want to make also people aware of the dangers and pitfalls. So here, it's not to keep. Uh, young kids busy with their screen time for hours and hours each day. No, actually to take a much really active role in terms of creating experiences for kids, right? Going to places. And that creates very different people. So uh, uh, I would also say there is hope, <laughs> right? Uh, but it is also for us to um, uh, see where we stand on it, being just frustrated and dealing with our own frustration about it. Uh, that doesn't help me nor others, right? What do we do with this frustration? How can we create more positive ways to turn this frustration into something more positive? Uh, maybe engaging with the groups, starting conversation in your family circles, uh, and then also non-threatening way. So here it's about not taking away and banning the technology. Here it is to find better ways to live with the te technology, right? That is more supportive emotionally, socially, but also more fulfilling for everybody, uh, ourselves included, right? So quite, quite important. Um, I do have some more slides related to also some of the issues related to adults that are put into their workplaces where technology is provided by organizations that sometimes also in a way that it creates really huge impacts. So we are calling this techno stress. We are in essence software updates. Right, and I, I tell you something here about the UF. <laughs> you have a new system called UF Go, and after six months, everybody at UF says, UF Go has to go, <laughs> because it's so horrible, the system. And everybody has to use it for everything they do at UF, right? Accounting, travel, everything. And everybody's crazy. Staff members cannot operate it. We got one hour training and the system is nowhere to go, ready to go. Techno stress, poor, right? We spend triple, four times more time on the system to do our work. This is techno stress, right? Now, in terms of uh, techno stress related, uh, there's also a developing techno anxiety. For example, there's a new software. I cannot do it, cannot submit what I need to submit to do my work, right? And sometimes bosses, they ignore and don't understand or don't want to understand, <laughs> right? Techno anxiety, technophobia, where one says simply at work, I don't want to do this anymore, right? No, I don't want to have this mountain of emails, right, uh, opened hundreds and hundreds every day, right? It becomes a phobia. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, techno uh, add addiction is also an issue. But the symptoms, when we look here, are quite significant. They range from panic, anxiety, resistance, technophobia, mental fatigue, physical ailments of uh, various kinds, intolerance and perfectionism, right? muscle cramps, so we see how it's headaches, physical reactions to this type of techno stress, and of course sleeplessness is on the list as well. So this techno stress has really uh, severe also impacts and results, but two main stressors exist. One is this information overload, and you might uh, have been exposed to it as well, where there is really also a large uh, increase in terms of everything, email, instant message, messaging. Everything has to be digital, but typically it's much more complicated than actually like, writing something down. <laughs> Right? There are complicated forms that needs to be filled and uh, 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 processed. So information overload and the second one is constant availability. Because organizations know that we have smartphones, that we have access to the internet 24-7. And so the expectation is weekends, evenings, you have to be available anytime and if somebody doesn't respond, Right? Uh, within 24 hours, you get blamed or complained about. So here, it has to do also with changing cultures that this type of techno overload and uh, stresses, like for example, we see here tech uh, invasion, techno complexity, where everything gets much more complex. These forms and web applications that are out there and also techno uncertainty, the constant upgrades and changes. And sometimes the whole system changes overnight. On a Monday morning, you open your computer, and everything has to be done now differently. <laughs> but there's no training, there's, there's no information available, uh, the instructions are already outdated. That is techno stress. Right? Now, in terms of... Um, in terms of well-being, of course, this severely also impacts uh, and leads to overload, to an invasion of our space. Uh, I talked already about complexity, but also privacy. It swaps into our personal life. It infringes our personal life in the evening hours when we actually are really are supposed to have free time, but we don't, right? Because there's still something else to be done. Uh, and also, of course, uh, yeah, inclusion and sense of inferiority, that we feel so small relative to this complexity of these tech giants, right, that, uh, 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 and IT departments that are running our lives. <laughs> and this, uh, of course, is a major, major, major problem. And, uh, yeah, that's where I like to also uh, stop and invite to a an, an last reflection because we are, we are uh, out of time to ponder really about in terms of technology can be perceived also and create stresses. Now, with every stress that comes at us related, we know that cortisol uh, uh, floods our body, our blood pressure increases, it has health impacts. Every stress diminishes our well-being. Right? The question is, with stresses, and I said here, perceived stress, how we perceive it, how we respond to it. If we actually are mindfully present and stay grounded, we respond to such stresses in different ways. And that is the key, also with these stresses. Not to actually get overwhelmed and say, I have to work now 10 more hours to cope with the workload that has been created by some, by some tech platforms or, or UFGO or upgrades. Because here it is also to make people aware that there is a limit 
uh, to what also is healthy and uh, uh, impacts one's well-being. So every stress can be responded to also to create a more mindful response. And a mindful response in this way is also to say, well, okay, with this new system, what uh, uh, needs to be done and to do this at a pace that one can also, in a very healthy way, right, deal with it. Uh, or make others aware that this system is absolutely not supportive and it has to change. <laughs> Right, so to create actually a different environment with less uh, stresses. But techno stress uh, in organizations have become really also an extremely big issues that um, for those of us uh, who are active in the workforce, uh, it is real, it is real, right? The question uh, is how we respond. And any uh, last reflections on that, if you have any that you'd like to share? Um, yeah. Up until a few months ago, I was in the workforce. Okay. And for, I worked for a very large company. And uh, like everybody has stress, because whenever you put out a new system, it was a flaw. And you just didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember mm. times when things were time sensitive, mm -hmm. you knew the system was going to blow up. Um, then, fortunately, I got retired before we implemented a new file storage system <laughs> that was, going to, it was actually supposed to break things down uh -huh. so that you have public information in one place, confidential information in the other. Yeah. But they were never clear about how they were going to migrate all the files <laughs> and separate it and know which was public and which was confidential. Uh, how do you feel now that yeah. you're out of that yeah. environment? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that tells you something. It's like yeah. from two phones yeah. to two laptops. Yeah, right. So that yeah. phone yeah. one laptop. Yeah. So. I hear you. Uh, I can fully relate to that. Uh, but it is, tells you also something in terms of truly, it is the environment, right? The organization decision also for creating these uh, softwares or platforms, make it better for the whole organization, or uh, also uh, be conscientious about our own mental health. Uh, if so, we take a mental health break. <laughs> uh, yes. This is one thing I, I, I have a my grandson is a freshman mm. in college. Mm. His one way of dealing with this is he took ball and dance. Because you have to look at your partner and you touch someone. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's so it's a physical contact. Right. 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 So smart. <laughs> I like to meet your grandson. <laughs> because that is a wonderful response. But it came out of his awareness, right? Uh, in terms of making this decision. Mm -hmm. And all of that. So yeah. So, uh, really seeking also counter experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Touch, movement, body movement, to embody ourselves. That is actually something we can do also to respond to tech stress and tech overload. Yeah. Oh, so smart at a young age. <laughs> Took me longer to grasp that fully. <laughs> yeah. I know, you're talking about that. Like something I did with my friends, um, my roommate, we'll like just put our phone away. Like we'll intentionally want to do dinner, or from out friends, and, like let's do no phone time. Mm. Yeah. It was very intentional, so we can all be connected. And it feels great. And like, I think that's an easy way to kind of offer when we're family. Grab dinner, like, what if we all see their phone away for now? You know? And I think that suggestion is sometimes all. Oh, love it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good strategy. Yeah. And it's much more enjoyable yeah. to be for that time, right? Without phone. Yeah. Yeah, switching off phones or 
I know that uh, some groups have started also to actually collect the phones, put them yeah, right. <laughs> in basket, and then after the talk, it can be picked up again. Uh, uh, that is also one way to just have the experience, right, or re-experience, to reconnect with just enjoying right, the social uh, space, the social experience. Uh, or uh, being out uh, in nature, that can be also so uh, healing. So there are many, many good ways to also counter it. And sometimes it is also to just try it out and uh, expand on it, because this is also how we can better relate also to all these technologies that are out there, find new ways, right? better ways. To uh, reconnect uh, to ourselves and everything else. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about how you would invite your students to put away their phones and tablets when you're, uh, when you're with them. I know there's a difference between undergrads and graduate students. There is. Uh, we have specific courses that actually also have uh, built into. For example, specific assignments that are done, for example, 24 hours, no phone, or, or tech use. Uh, uh, but they are intentional, right? Uh, to just let people go through the experience and then talk about it, digest it, integrate it, and see. Now, uh, in an educational environment uh, at UF, it's rather difficult to, uh, uh, for example, not allow students uh, in, in classes or for longer periods of time to use their, not use their phones uh, or tablets. So we use rather a strategy to integrate technology in a way that is more supportive into the educational process, right? In terms of not uh, uh, creating more techno stress. I wouldn't say all colleagues are doing it, right? Uh, but at least I, I can talk from my perspective what I try to do. Because discussion time, that's quality time, that's classroom time. That's how I like to use my classroom time, to have this dialogue, to have really space to discuss. Because honestly, the internet provides all the other stuff, right? The knowledge <laughs> uh, that uh, can be even nowadays with chat GPT, AI generated, right? But what we, I think, as educational uh, uh, institutions can do is to critically look at it and discuss it. Is this something what you, what, that you would say uh, is, uh, uh, makes sense? Is it meaningful? Right, to have a conversation about it and develop also uh, critical thinking skills and a critical approach to become more aware if something is really also provided that is not as meaningful. So to make that really part of the conversation in our classes, right? I'd rather uh, have um, a policing going on in terms of per syllabus that you have specific also restrictions in your course. For example, uh, there was a big discussion actually at the University of Florida related to AI systems that are now spreading like crazy that students use also to create their papers, right? So how do we deal with it? And uh, overall, the strategy that is now have become really part of going forward is we know these tools are out there. We cannot police them, right? Because in their private, in their private laptops, they, they can access it. Rather for us, it's to work in relation with these tools, right? In terms of be critical uh, uh, and uh, introduce them also to a critical mind, not to rely on what a, a computer system generates, right? Because sometimes it's just stupid, <laughs> right? So to have this discernment developed in terms of uh, what makes sense, what is meaningful. Can you confirm it with, for example, scientific knowledge, scientific data, right? Can you back it up, discuss it, remold it? And uh, with that, I think we all can grow 
rather than uh, with the technology, because here it is also to develop new ways uh, with the technology that is out there to relate in it also in a way that uh, is healthy and positive and does not create all these negative things that I also talked about that have been very well researched and of course there's major concern. So we all play a part in it, uh, in creating also a future that we can also embrace and feel good about it. Right? And it's a process. We are not there. Yeah, it's very dynamic. Mm. Well, given the amount of time, and thanks for staying over. I think I stopped here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's give one more round of applause for you, Dr. Thank you so much for joining us.